The study reported in the anniversary article was part of a research project supported by the Royal Society of New Zealand through its Marsden Fund. This is a fund that aims to support the exploration of new ideas that foster creativity and innovation and that are unlikely to be funded through other sources. Uh, I am very grateful to the Royal Society for its support because I do not think I would have got financial support anywhere else. The project was called The Role of Explicit Knowledge in Second Language Proficiency and Acquisition and was carried out at the University of Auckland by a team of people, Kathy Elder, Sean Lowen, Rosemary Earlham and Jennifer Philp, uh, as well as some research assistants. Apart from the article bearing my name, the project led to a number of other publications, including a book called Implicit and Explicit Knowledge in Second Language Learning, Testing and Teaching, which was published by Multilingual Matters in 2009. The title of the book reflects the scope of the project, which was in three parts. The aim of the first part was to develop a set of tests that would provide relatively separate measures of implicit and explicit knowledge of second language grammar. The second part explored the extent to which the tests we developed could account for second language proficiency, which we operationalized as scores on two standard proficiency tests, IELTS and TOEFL. And then the third part utilized the tests we developed to investigate what effect various kinds of form-focused instruction had on L2 learners' acquisition of implicit and explicit knowledge. The anniversary article grew out of the research that we completed for the first part of the project. This then was the context of the anniversary article. But what was the research context that led to the Marsden project? For several years I had been interested in the distinction between implicit and explicit knowledge, influenced in particular by the work of Arthur Reber and Nick Ellis, and also the claim that these two types of knowledge are distinct, although potentially interconnected, and that they involve different kinds of language processing and language use. I also had a long-term interest in form-focused instruction and its effect on second language acquisition. Putting these two areas of interest together, I wanted to be able to conduct research that would shed light on what kind of knowledge form-focused instruction has an effect on. Does it just result in the kind of knowledge that is only available for control processing, that is, explicit knowledge? If so, arguably, the role of form-focused instruction is a very limited one, as it does not contribute to the development of true communicative ability, as Crasher has long claimed. Or did it result in the kind of knowledge needed to engage easily and fluently in everyday activity, that is, implicit knowledge? If so, form-focused instruction has an important role to play in language teaching. These questions were, and in fact still are, central to my over overriding interest in SLA as a field of research, namely that it should inform and can inform language teaching. In order to address these questions, it's necessary to use tests that are capable of providing distinct measures of implicit and explicit knowledge. The problem was that when I looked at the existing research investigating form-focused instruction, such tests did not exist. By and large, researchers were content to make claims about the efficacy of form-focused instruction based on the results of tests that allowed for controlled language processing and thus very likely only tapped learners' explicit knowledge. There was of course a reason for this. It's much easier to devise tests that measure specific grammatical features by means of grammaticality judgments, multiple choice and constrained production namely tests that are likely to tap into explicit knowledge. But if the claims that some SLA researchers wish to make 
about the value of form-focused instruction were to have any merit, it seemed to me that it was necessary to show that it benefited implicit knowledge. To achieve this, tests of implicit knowledge were needed. I was also motivated by another concern. In the 1980s and 1990s, strong claims had been made about the importance of implicit knowledge and the relative unimportance of explicit knowledge in language proficiency. I questioned this. While I agreed that implicit knowledge was primary, I saw explicit knowledge as also important for certain types of language use. For example, monitoring output in writing. Thus, I saw language proficiency as a composite of implicit and explicit knowledge. But to investigate this, tests that could distinguish these two types of knowledge were needed. Thus, in part one of the Marston project, we set about designing tests, which on theoretical grounds, we believe would provide relatively separate measures of implicit and explicit knowledge. We identified a set of 17 grammatical structures and administered a battery of tests to sample both native speakers and L2 learners' knowledge of English. We used factor analysis to examine whether our predictions about what the tests were measuring could be confirmed. By and large, they were. We concluded that an oral elicited imitation test, an oral production test, and a time grammaticality judgment test provided measures of implicit knowledge. And an untimed grammaticality judgment test and a test of meta language served as measures of explicit knowledge. The results of the various analyses that we carried out are reported in the anniversary article. In general, the results of the study were not surprising as they affirmed what we expected to find. However, we certainly learned a lot from conducting the study. For example, the, ex the exploratory factor analyses we used were challenged in an article published a year or so later in Studies in Second Language Acquisition. In this article, Isimonga pointed out that we should have used confirmatory, not exploratory factor analysis. He was right, and in Ellis and Lowen, in an article published in 2007, we re-ran the analysis using confirmatory factor analysis, with essentially the same results. We were also able to, to test and dismiss another possible distinction built into the tests, namely that what they really distinguished was production versus decision-making. In other words, thanks to Isimunga's challenge, we were able to strengthen our claim that the test did indeed distinguish implicit and explicit knowledge and not production versus decision-making. But while there was no major surprise, there were a number of serendipitous findings of our study that were interesting. For example, as expected, the native speakers outscored the L2 learners on all the tests, but the two groups' explicit knowledge scores were much closer than their implicit knowledge scores. In other words, what really distinguished the native speakers and the L2 learners was the difference in their implicit knowledge. This result is, of course, not so surprising, given that most L2 learners in our sample had learned English in a classroom. But it did point to the construct validity of the tests. Another interesting finding was that the grammatical and ungrammatical sentences in the grammaticality judgment tests were functioning differently. For example, it was only the scores for the ungrammatical items in the untimed grammaticality judgment test that loaded onto the explicit factor in the factor analysis. Again, this is perhaps not so surprising, as arguably it is easier to bring explicit rule-based knowledge to bear 
in order to identify what is ungrammatical more so than what is grammatical. There were some minor surprises. Some of the hypotheses we investigated were not supported. For example, we predicted that the L2 learners would be more certain about their implicit than their explicit knowledge. But in fact, the opposite proved to be the case. There was a stronger relationship between the learner's level of certainty and their use of explicit knowledge. L2 learners, perhaps, enjoy greater security when they can access their explicit knowledge, especially in a testing situation. I don't think we thought much about whether our research would influence the field, although I suppose we hoped it would. I think we were just preoccupied and excited in getting the research done. Did the research influence the field? I guess it has if Google citations or replications and challenges by other researchers are used as measures of its influence. It it's been pleasing to see a number of replications of the research and even more pleasing to see that they reported very similar findings. Melissa Bowles' study, also published in Studies in Second Language Acquisition, was especially interesting as she investigated the same battery of tests but for L2 Spanish and also included two very different samples of learners, classroom and heritage learners. Her predictions about differences in the profiles of these two groups, profiles of implicit and explicit knowledge, were borne out. The classroom learners were strong in explicit knowledge and the heritage learners in implicit. Perhaps though it is the challenges to my article that I found especially rewarding as they reflect an ongoing concern with the development of valid tests of implicit knowledge. It was precisely this concern that was the primary motivation for the Marsden project. De Kaiser and his co-researchers have argued that the illicit imitation test does not measure implicit knowledge, but rather automated explicit knowledge. I'm happy to acknowledge that this might be the case. Perhaps other tests such as the word monitoring task that tap into unconscious online process processing are needed to provide true measures of implicit knowledge. But such tests are difficult to administer and if, as de Kaiser has suggested, automated explicit knowledge is functionally equivalent to implicit knowledge, then an elicited imitation test is still of value and arguably it is of greater face validity for teachers. The Marsden project focused exclusively on grammar, reflecting the centrality of grammar in much SLA research. But the implicit explicit distinction is applicable to other aspects of language. And I'm now embarking on another project funded by the Australian Research Council to investigate tests that measure implicit and explicit pragmatic knowledge. Current tests of pragmatic knowledge such as discourse completion tasks, are very clearly biased towards explicit knowledge. I'm looking forward to this new challenge.